You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. If you bumped into Delta Goodrum on the street in late 2018, chances are she wouldn't have spoken to you. She probably would have smiled and put her head down and just kept walking, but not for the reasons you think. My name is Mia Friedman and you're listening to No Filter, an interview podcast from Mamma Mia with people who tell their stories very candidly and aren't afraid to be vulnerable. In October 2018, at the age of 33, Delta Goodrum went in for an operation that should have been pretty standard, but there were complications and they led to a paralysis of a nerve in her tongue. The woman who has been performing publicly since she was a teenager lost the ability not just to sing. Delta couldn't speak. My livelihood is my sound. Trying to decide whether this is getting any better or not doesn't feel like. She underwent months of speech therapy, but nobody could tell her if she would ever be able to speak clearly or to sing again. A quick reminder of Delta's story. She was signed to Sony Records when she was 15. By 16, she was playing Nina Tucker on Neighbours. By 17, she'd released her first single, Born to Try, And just a year later, when she was 18, she was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that's not even half of it. She's dated some high-profile men, including an engagement to a fellow pop star. And she's been a judge on The Voice for nine years. And at only 36, Delta has climbed a lot of mountains. She has a new album coming out, and the first track is called Keep Climbing. I've publicly defended Delta many times when I felt she was being attacked for reasons that seemed to pretty much boil down to the fact that she's a self-proclaimed dag and that she tries hard. How trying hard to succeed or to bring people joy with her music is a bad thing, well, I've never been able to understand that. So when she came into Mamma Mia, I wanted to start off with that moment in 2018 when her body hit reset. What was your life like? 2018, the start of 2018. I believe I had dyed my hair dark and I believe That's I... That's always a sign that some, something's going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, totally. For something's point, right? changing. You get a fringe or you yeah, dye I your hair? I got a fringe as well. So, whoa, whoa. <laughs> so you had a lot of feelings. That's what feelings. it means. You had a lot well, of feelings. Well, I was in between. I'd sort of just... 2016, 17 was like Wings of the Wild era. Leading into obviously um, September, October was when I went through losing my speech and what you're referring to. Before that, I remember a highlight being the Commonwealth Games. That was really special, mm. writing the song for that. And I, for some reason, think of 2018 and I think of that being a really beautiful moment. Were you in a good place career-wise Personal wise, before this reset, yeah, before the operation, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, I believe I was just, you know, getting on with kind of what you I weren't do. restless, so you you weren't looking for a reset, or you no, weren't feeling like I you needed one. Now I one hundred percent was like, oh, I definitely did, but not in any way, shape, or form was I kind of thinking I did mm. need something like that, but. As fate would have it, I think my flight was booked. I was meant to go over to spend a lot of time with the wonderful Amy Wadge, who I wrote all of my friends with. And I was just on the writing train. I'd started to write. For the next album. For the next album. So that was kind of what I had started to do was go back to the piano. What is it that I – so I'd started organically knowing where my compass had said that it was time to kind of go to – I definitely couldn't have foreseen the rest of that year. What do they say? Life is what happens while we're busy making other plans. So you had your plans in 2018. Mm -mm. And then what happened to your salivary gland? Uh, an infection in the salivary gland and then as a How does that effect, happen? You know, I'm not quite sure. So it's just like a right random that. thing, like it could be an infection in your toe. Look, it had played up a couple times since I was younger. Was it connected to the cancer? I don't know. It's not. I can't say for sure and I can't say not for sure. That was definitely a conversation. But mm. I see my neck is a real, you know, problem area. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> a Freud psychologist would have all sorts of yeah, yeah. things I'll to say about go that. Go for it. I'd be fascinated. Tell me yeah. more. Tell me more. I'm always on the discussion. Discovery train. But no, it, you know, what happened was it was it a routine operation. So they decided to take it out 
Yes. Just so it yeah, was that up. a big deal? Like, were you told that's a big deal? I mean, I imagine anything no, I around think, your neck or your mouth is uh, a big deal when I, you're a singer. Look, I think there's a lot more bigger deals for people to go through. So it was what it was. Um, I've heard you say that so many times. I, I wonder <laughs> as women that we always have to say, look, I know everyone's got it worse. I know mm. that. But, like, that is a massive deal. Yeah. I do feel that, though. I think that yeah. I, it is part of my heart. I do feel that because I think I've crossed paths with a lot of different people mm, that um, go through a lot. So I really do understand that, you know, I'm healthy. I've got a great job. and So was it an operation like getting your tonsils out? I don't know if it was as far as that, okay. no. A um, bit more? A bit more than that. It's something that happens, happens yeah. to people. Were you meant to have a long recovery or it was just going to be? No, it would have been quicker, meant to yeah. be quicker. But... I knew when I woke up that there was definitely, I just had a gut feeling. I was like, mm. oh, I think I'm in this for a second. I had to stay in for a little while and then kind of uh, heal and heal and heal. And then we started to realise that it wasn't really swelling. It wasn't swelling that was happening. It was. So you said I'm having, I we said kept thinking, normal having trouble talking because. No, no, yeah, yes, swe- yes, yes, swelling, yes, yes, of course. Yes. Yep. My doctors are incredible. So I really yeah. do like stress that it does happen. It's just like one it's, of those things. You know, you go in for any operation or you go in for any, you know, routine dental and yeah. something, you know, you have to, you have things to be. can happen. You never know. And then basically, I think that there was a, a bit of pressure on something that had no. caused damage. And was there a moment where someone said to you, this is what's happened? Yeah, for sure. It's just one of those moments that says it's not swelling, it's bruised. So we just got to, you don't know exactly when a nerve will come back together, whether it's three months, six months, three years. So nerves can never. repair themselves? Yes, unless they're cut. No, but it meant that it's still positive. That, that so you were back. told it can recover, but no one yes, could tell you but how no long it would take. Long. Yes, yeah. Did you panic? I mean, I think that it's a normal human reaction to go through the different emotions. But no, I had I had a job to do and that was to go to speech therapy and to start to work at it. And of course, as a singer, you know your voice intricately and you know all the details of every tiny little sound and what it sounds like. What did it feel like? Was it like having gone to the dentist? Not really, no, even though that was the facade of, of what it would sound like. But it's slows everything down and it was a lot more, um, well, it's just hard. It's quite hard. How do you repair a nerve? Like what was the speech therapy that you had to do? It's important to keep it moving and to keep going, keep the receptors trying to communicate. Was that tiring? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You definitely, when you, you know, you see in the video, I uh, share that it's like you're doing sh- and you're doing all the different sounds all the time and can be very frustrating for someone going through that. And, you know, I'm sure a listener, a couple of, you know, would be listening right now to your amazing program and knowing that feeling of just having to, it's like going to a gym. It's like going to a gym, you know, for your muscles. You've got to yeah. kind of rework them and they do change and it is changed and you just, as a singer, finding new placements and but this is what did you, know, you sound different when you first started to sing? Oh, I mean, I think the silver lining for me is that it gives a new depth to sing from. Do you have to consciously, like, are you consciously aware of your tongue? Occasionally, now, yeah, yeah occasionally, because occasionally. it's something you just take for granted: talking, eating, <laughs> singing. Yeah, occasionally for sure. It's sometimes a little bit of a trip, you know, and you and you kind of like slur a little bit or something. Is it when you get tired? No, it's no, not it's a tired. Just, thing. No, no, no. But it, it's, I mean, I'm singing away. I I feel the strongest in my voice I ever have. I feel like the word triggered is often overused, but after what you'd been through when you were 18, mm. there must have been a real psychological battle to win as well with, I thought I'd climbed the mountain. I thought <laughs> I'd climbed that mountain and I did. And now I'm at the bottom of another mountain. Is that how it felt? I think in all our lives, there's like this circadian rhythm, like when you go to sleep, like there's that sort of flow that at times, you know, you, you kind of conquer something and then you, mm. you go into another, a different chapter. I didn't really look at it as like, oh no, this is, I just sort of looked at, this is what is happening right now. And I have to surrender because the more you panic, the more that stressful it becomes. I definitely had my moments without a doubt, which I would, you know, call mum and be in a complete state of very, very better. I I think it was very, very important that that journey for me was private because Mm. that was definitely not something that I would have dealt with as well in front of people. I needed to know that I was going to get back to my voice being back. Otherwise, that would have been a little too much for me. By saying that, do you mean, because I remember very clearly exactly where I was when I found out that you were sick when you were 18. Yeah. 
And that it was all public for you. You had no choice at that time, did you? Yeah, I think that I didn't associate this moment in my life with that moment. Wow. I have gone through so many different colourful moments of life after that, that that one seems like a longer time ago um, mm. and still feel present because of the people you talk to when it comes to somebody yeah. who's currently in the fight and you want to shed some um, light, not that I'm a poet right now, you want to, you know, sort of remind somebody that they can get through it. And I think that part's been a blessing throughout my entire career to be able to give people, um, you know, hope. hope. I know people who had Hodgkin's lymphoma, they've called it the Delta cancer. Yep, yep. And they've used you, I'm sure you've heard this before, as a beacon of it's the Delta cancer, I'm going to be okay. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. I mean, um, yeah. I think if you believe that anything can happen, like I believed I could have a number one record or I believed that anything is possible, then I, I can't be so naive to think that anything can't happen at all. Like it's just mm -hmm. that sort of belief system that, well, I really haven't been at one of those people that's ever thought, well, oh, why is this happening? Or I do kind of think to myself, well, I mean, okay, you know, anything's possible. So it's 2018, you've got this news, so yep. much for those plans, <laughs> but you've decided that you want to deal with this privately because yes, if yes, you yes, don't, yes. it becomes I just you didn't managing want that everyone feeling else's of feelings. like, you know, will she, I, did, I think it was a really spiritual, I guess there's like a, I stayed very, very quiet in a tucked away place and spent a lot of time in nature and just... You know, my partner, my family were very, my friends are, oh my God. The people in my life, like I really am a ride or die kind of person. Um, mm. The people I love, I love with all my heart. I'll do anything for very much the lion of like, you know, I've got their back. They've got mine. Because nothing leaked. No, 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 no. Nothing my, my leaked. My are all, you know. I don't even mean from your friends. I just mean, I imagine you had a lot of life to unravel. Yes. Like, Requests, tour commitments, oh, albums. Well, we just stopped everything. Like, What was the story you gave? Well, when I'd go to a coffee shop, for example, yeah. then I'd been to the dentist. Because <laughs> so oh, you sounded dentist. like uh, yeah. your speech was I, impaired. Yes. Yeah, very. Yeah. A lot of the time someone would speak for me. It just looked like I was being a real diva for a minute there. <laughs> now you can like, do that. This is a lot of day. And it's then like, someone would say. She doesn't, she doesn't talk to Because she was pretty much what happened. Like, or I'd be like, can I please have a coffee? Can I please have this? And that's genuinely no my truth. It. Well, or you'd say, I'm sorry, I've been at the dentist. And because that was pretty much what I would. No one questions that. Yeah, well, and also that was people would think, well, if there was something wrong with your voice, I would have heard about it. Yeah. So. But the thing is, is that when I released that video, and I know I'm going back to this positivity, but when I released that video, I was super nervous. Like I, my heart was pounding. What I, were you I, worried about? You know, I knew that it felt right in the sense that we were all going through this huge reset in the world. And it was really important for me to say, you just don't know what someone's going through. You never know what someone is going through when you meet them. When you cross paths, you don't know. And I thought to myself... The idea of what we've, you know, kind of working hard towards getting out of it and sharing where this new body of work could come from, where the music could come from, mm. why I had taken a second to make a record. But then when I pressed it and the minute, you know, you realise that shared experience of that somebody said to me, my mother-in-law, she actually, I think it was, uh, what was the first one I saw, had a stroke and is not unable to speak. She's having a communication challenge right now. I started to see more people that had communication challenges. Obviously, a lot of people live with them. And I started to hear from people. I just would never had someone in the UK straight. It was like, I actually had a paralysis that like just numerous stories. And all of a sudden I went like, I'll get like happy tears thinking about it because it's like, I just realized, wow, that, you know, I know we're in a new world of transparency and opening up, but there's a fine line in this new world of how much is too much. And, yeah, you know, because I came from a world of mystery growing up. That's what we kind of came about with musicians. Um, Do you mean that music is like this mysterious force? Well, when I was growing up, you'd see the Whitney's and Mariah's and oh, that you'd see it as like a oh, yeah. mysterious kind of... You wouldn't know what was going on You would know like the, the food that they've eaten at lunch or, you know. <laughs> so. And then that expectation was put upon you from the time you were a teenager. Well, yeah, I was only 15 years old when I signed to Sony Music. I was 16 on Neighbours, 17, and, you know, watched I come out when I was 17. So it was very young. I think I was so much older at that point. You and always then, do when you're a teenager, you know, don't you? Yeah, like, 
<laughs> I'm so mature. <laughs> I still think it even when I look yeah. back a few years, I'm like, I am still a kid. <laughs> like, I was still the youngest coach on the panel half the time, most of the entire time. <laughs> I know. I actually went, I Everyone realized I didn't know I'm, how old you were. I yeah, was yeah. like, is she 27? Like, I oh, was I'll like, go with that. <laughs> yeah. And I was going to ask you about turning 35. Yeah, yeah. You said that for women and your friends and for you, what did that mean? I mean, it feels great. I feel like it gets better and better. Like it definitely does. It does. Everything every woman shares with you when they say, oh, you'll feel this at 28. Oh, you feel this at 30. You feel this at 35. It's so true. Yeah. It's all true. It is true. They're cliches you do, you for a reason. You get more confident. Yeah, for sure. I think it was really smart you deciding not to share your experience in real time. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because I think that we are in this society that firstly expects of people mm. in the public eye, and I know you hate mm. the word famous, <laughs> but people, celebrities, yeah. we do want to know what they've eaten for breakfast yeah, yeah, and yeah. all of those things about the intimate life. And then you overlay on that this blogging culture and social media where everyone's talking about this is how I'm feeling at this second mm. and you end up just with a lot of unprocessed stuff out there. Totally, totally. And I don't know that's if a that's great healthy perception. for the person sharing it or the people reading it. It's definitely not my natural reaction. Like yourself coming from writing and, and being thought provoking, like I can never, like when it comes to posting when something has happened, I just can't do it. I find it very hard. It's not my natural being. I'm still learning so much when it comes to my phone and, and definitely during COVID, you know, from doing living room sessions, like performances, I started to learn and to start to love it a bit more and understand mm. that I could connect to people still and bring to have that beautiful connection still was beautiful and more creative. I started to understand, oh, I can be creative with this. This is fun. I can create. Yeah. create. So the creative part of me has started to understand that's a new sharing place. So that I have enjoyed. But um. My feelings, like when something happens, that's I feel everything very, very deeply. I always have them incredibly empathetic. I feel somebody's pain in a room very much. Mm -hmm. um, it's like I'll always be like a month later because it means too much to me, the gravity and realness of certain moments. I think it's amazing other people can do that. I take a lot to process, think about mm -hmm. it, mull on it. And also I imagine keep stuff for yourself. Yeah. Like so much of your life has been public since you were so young. And I feel in a good balance with that. I think we're in a, I'm in a great place with Aussies. I feel like it's a time to enjoy that. I think that... Um, when I've, you say Aussies, is there a time when you moved to LA because you just had to get away from here for a bit? Oh, yeah. I mean, like I still had the entire Australian population at my house half the time when I was over there. I'd still have like <laughs> if anybody didn't have like a Thanksgiving to go to, I'd be like, oh, I'll, my placemats would get bigger and bigger and bigger with all the Australians <laughs> saying, no, no, I'll stay with all the Aussies. But, you know, the different chapters, which I know you you have shared and been a part of and been a fierce warrior. You've in, been through some shit times. So that's why in these moments – you know, I'm not going anywhere. I love what I do. I'm in this for the long haul. I continue to challenge myself. I'm on my own. Yeah. Like, I know when I can improve, I'm like, oh, that wasn't my, you know, I could do better at that or I could have prepared more or, you know, there's all that sort of self-improvement. Uh, having people project their own feelings of their own stuff onto you is an interesting energy and then learning to go oh that's their world they're creating and that's sort of how they feel and mm. you can't take that on it takes a while to get used to kind of going oh I don't take that on oh hang on a minute why is the justified versus unjustified you know so those ones I'm Mia Friedman and you're listening to No Filter with Delta Goodrum I've been thinking about you a lot over the last few days knowing that we were going Talking. to chat today and I was thinking about the complicated relationship we have in Australia with, well, not just Australia, but generally with women who are ambitious, mm -hmm. women who want things for themselves and who want to work hard and who don't sort of downplay that, oh, it just happened, yeah, you know. Right. It's like yeah. that game that celebrities have to play. How do you look that way? I just laugh and I just, you know, take some deep breaths. <laughs> it's like, no, you don't. You go to the gym every day and you're really disciplined and you work hard. I wish I could say I went to the gym every day, Mia. <laughs> no, but, I some, wish I but some, like it's, it's that thing that as a woman, if you yeah. say, I really want to be successful, I really want this, mm. and it's that born to try. I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know about yourself. <laughs> but what I admire so much about you, you don't try to act cool. Yeah. Like you don't try to be like. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> You're not just like, oh, here's just something I wrote you. Like I poured my heart and soul into these songs. Yeah, yeah. 
I think I was like this actually from the day I was at school. I um, I wasn't really swayed easily by trends. I do care that, you know, people feel comfortable in the space of with me, that there's no um, – it's cool to be kind. There's nothing, you know, sort of wrong with being a woman who works really hard at what they do and has a vision and has understands that, you know, they're always a student. But at the same time also owning their worth and knowing what they actually bring and knowing, you know, they can withstand the different storms. And yeah, I got no. that a lot in this album. Yeah. It's that idea of knowing your worth, like in billions where yeah. it's like – I don't have to marry anyone. I yeah, make my yeah, own yeah, money. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what it is. And that's what this whole album was meant to be. It was about owning my story and, and me facing that too. So th- there is songs where I'm trying to face myself and say, well, you know, maybe I would have done this better or maybe I, you know, did I go left or right? And, you know, you have all those check in moments. But once you face them, it's quite amazing now that I've written the record and there's certain parts of me that I, I might have lent into, into a vulnerability or something within myself and challenged myself to look at that, I feel like I've kind of even just from talking about this week, I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm good with that. I, don't, I think I've moved on from that. Yeah. Because it, it's that thing of, you know, when you keep pressing on one pressure point and you keep going and then you don't feel it anymore. And I think that that's definitely been sort of a tactic or a tactic. Can you give me an example of that that you can think of? I was telling a story in the song Kill Them With Kindness and it talks about going viral for the very first time. Tell now, that story. Now, I have never experienced this before in my life. I was in Los Angeles and I, it just been a bit of a hard week, you know. It just wasn't a fantastic week and my beautiful friend Renee was like, I've got a surprise, we're going to Beyonce tonight, went to the concert We had such a great night. I remember it was outside, stars were sparkling and I thought, oh, you know, everything's going to be okay. It's all all right. And we were just dancing and I had this experience of being at the concert where, you know, kept sort of bumping me and I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. There was no seats next to this gentleman. And I said, would you mind moving over there? I was so happy to be out at Beyonce. Like I was like, this is, the music was pumping. That entire, yeah, that Mm. entire record, that Beyonce record was like (sighs) on repeat in this moment in in the household. You know, obviously living with my girlfriend and we were just playing with it. And I was only like 26 or 27 at this age, right? And then obviously I went to bed and, and there was a numerous kind of step-by-steps that happened. I thought, oh, that's strange, strange. What was the first sign that something was up? I opened my eyes and I got my phone and it was like scroll, scroll, scroll. So I was like, what the? And I scroll, scroll, scroll. And I was like, what the? Zip, 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 zip. And I was like, what has happened? And then, you know, there's your alerts, but then there's like, wait, Viral. wait this is, I, I don't know what's happening. Like what is on my phone <laughs> I think right my now? my phone's broken. My phone's like telling me there's a lot here. And um, then I went straight to my mum's email and I shared this in the book and, and she said, darling, don't worry, you know, everything's good. And I was like, what? You know, when you get an email from your mum, just, I've had that email too, when my mum just going, darling, just don't just worry. Don't worry about it. I love you. And you're like, oh no. I'm like, what, what happened? And she said, you know, this, somebody had taken a picture of me at this concert and said something quite out there. And then mom, it was a comedian, and he'd yeah. taken a selfie and he'd mocked you and said, "I've got this uncoordinated white woman dancing next to me," yeah, and it was white mean yeah. and it was horrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was definitely it like funny. very, very aggressive. Yeah, considering I was just there, like living your life. Living life. There was no. Out of all the people I could have stood next to in this entire Super Bowl, and he was a famous comedian, and he didn't know who you were. Yeah, likewise, it wasn't. You didn't know I was, who she I was, was just there looking at the stage, going, yeah. "Yes, <laughs> having a ball." But the amazing part was that. So at this point, there'd been a lot of conversations about dancing, and you know, the show obviously that I was on, and at the Voice, and the and, Voice, and daggy dancing. You know, yeah, yeah. But like, I just have fun. It's like it's, and basically, this moment being about dancing, right? And saying how you know about being unrhythmic, blah 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 blah. And when I saw all these, it was quite vitriol. Like it was people were horrible. And I was like, "Is this about dancing? Like, really? This is about having fun at a Beyonce concert?" And I obviously responded with a laugh. I wanted to ask you about that. You posted a response that was a picture of mm. Elaine from Seinfeld doing Which a it did make me laugh. Daggy dance, yeah. and you said, "Had a great night last night." <laughs> yeah, and it was such a great clapback. Yeah, One of the you. all-time best clapbacks. Thank you. But I imagine there was a lot of pain and hurt underneath that. For sure. But the amazing part of this story is that 
you could put on music now. I would jump on every table that is outside your office here in front of everyone and I could dance for hours and hours. You could video me the entire time and I would feel nothing because it had really freed me from that feeling of worrying at all because the worst been, happened. everything had been said. Yeah. So the gratitude I have for that, even though that sounds a bit bizarre, it's quite incredible to think about those moments when they get brought to light, facing them and mm -hmm. then understanding to let it go and, you know, freeing yourself of those and having a, a fulfilling life where you can dance while the music's being played and dance while everyone's watching, who cares? Yeah, dance like no one's watching, even if everyone's watching, yeah. who cares? Yeah, and that is one of the lyrics in the song. It says, yeah. um, keep dancing even when they're watching. How do you write a song usually? Um, and how is this album different? Well, I mean, the principles of, of how I write a song have always been the same. I've pretty much always been a... It's never when you expect it. I'm, I'm not somebody who, whilst I can say, yes, I'm writing a song today and great songs are part of my life have been like a booked in session that it's like, okay, we're going this year at 10 o'clock. That sounds like pressure. And, yeah. I like mean, creatively. Exactly. And but that is how uh, most artists, it kind of rolls by arranged marriages. You go and meet somebody and pull your heart out and have a chat like we are. And you find something that you both kind of connect to. So how would it work if we were writing a song together? Yes, yes. What would we do? Would we meet for coffee first or would we literally, the studio's booked from <laughs> 10 till 4, like how does it work? Well, normally the best work I've ever sort of felt is when I come with an idea of like these are the kind of concept I want for my record, this is where I'm at. We'd sit down, talk like we are now, yep. have a conversation about where are you at in life, Mia? Tell me everything yep. that's going on. How are you feeling about that? We'd probably go into a big, deep and meaningful conversation about life. Then I would go over to the piano and I would start playing the sounds of what I feel we've just kind of spoken about might sound like. Does it come to you? Does it just Sometimes. come out of your fingers? <laughs> Sometimes not. Do you hear a melody in your head? It changes. I mean, you know, they do say that some of the biggest hit songs are always in like 20 minutes. But Born to Try, for example, was that for me. I had written three or four other songs and been playing uh, basketball out the back, then walking in and so should we write one more? And this album was kind of, I stayed at my house in the, in the US and I had this beautiful white piano and I was with a wonderful kindred, Marla, her and I would be exactly like this and we would sit there and talk and then we'd play and then we'd play music and dance around the room. It's very, you know, just sort of... Kind of organic. Yeah, it's just very organic. That's how it works for me. It's like when, yeah. when you least are expecting it, then you hear something that you go, that aha moments that people talk about. You go, oh, yes, that's what it is. That's what I feel. I was watching the clip for Billions and then watching some of your other videos Rewatching them, of course. <laughs> Thank you. I like how you say that. <laughs> it's not like I've never said them re yeah, them. Yeah, I was rewatching them. <laughs> and what struck me is that you are unlike pretty much any other female performer I can think of of your generation in that – this is going to sound judgy, but you've kept right. your clothes on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, judgy the other way. Judgy of people who didn't take, oh, their, right. who didn't keep their clothes <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah. And the reason that I was thinking about it was I'm because I'm thinking next record. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Not that you can't, don't have to, because I'm turning fifty this year. Yeah, and You're very there beautiful. are a whole lot of um, celebrities who, when they turn fifty, yep. like J Lo, Jennifer Aniston. They take their clothes off yeah, yeah. because it's like it's a primal thing to kind yeah. of go, I am still sexual. I am yeah, still yeah. a sexual being even if society says I'm not. I imagine there was a lot of pressure on you, I don't want to imagine, maybe there wasn't, over your career to take your clothes off and do those sexualized videos. Did you consciously just have a line in the sand? How do you deal with other people's views of how you should look and how you should be most marketable? Truthfully, I I I'm laughing because I there was having a joke before we came here saying about the next record. The next record is going to be nude. <laughs> we were joking about this on the way. No, I you still got that up your sleeve. Yeah, I still got. That. See, there's always more. There's always. But when more. you turn forty, that's when you do it. Take clothes, come off. No, you know what I mean. Like it kind of circling back to what we were saying before. I've been pretty strong headed my whole life in the sense that. I've sort of had my train track that is I know is who I am and um, mm. I don't think about those things or I'm not peer pressured very easily in any respect of my life. So you could probably have 100 people in the room saying, like when I was growing up and they say there's no Santa and I say, well, there is. And everyone would be like, well, there's not. And I would say, well, I believe that there is. And but what about okay. when your record company goes, we're looking for a bit more of a grown-up look? 
No one's ever really said that to me. So I haven't had those experiences in that respect. I've been with Sony for 20 years and I've had some wonderful guiding lights around me as well. Mm. You know, Have uh, you seen it happen to artists around you? I'm thinking about a young artist, or she's not so young anymore, but Gabriella Chilmy. Right. I remember when she came out, I can't remember what her song was, and it, she had this incredible voice, but then her album – she was really sexualized by her record company and she had to do like shoots in men's magazines and stuff and she walked away from the industry for years because she said she felt so uncomfortable about that and about the way she was sort of nudged. I haven't had that experience genuinely. That speaks to your power. I think somebody said something, I think it was Lady Gaga or somebody said once, if you come with a half full cup, like I feel I come in with this is what I see for the record. You know, these records happen by... I see a piece of artwork before every single album. I actually know what the cover is. Like this one, I had like a Patti Smith reference. And I was like, that's kind of what I see this album is. I don't know the music yet, but that's what I see it as. And I kind of laugh. Like for me, again, everyone has a very different experience. And I have such understanding of there's so many different ways and to And some experience. women want to and do totally. that. And that's, I mean, Beyonce can wear whatever she wants. Exactly. And so every, can J-Lo. And everybody, you know, I really understand that a lot of that is very much present and going on. But in my kind of having a very fierce mother next to me in my life and then having very strong women, mm. I think maybe starting so young and going, oh, this is my – like I walked in and had written my video clip. I'm telling you like, oh, this is what we're – I've never had that conversation. Mm. Maybe other people did around me and I'm unaware of it. Mm. But I could safely say that on that first record, you know, I kind of had my style. I I wasn't um, ever trying to chase a particular Mm. thing. How is your mum? She's really good. Yeah. Does she still manage you? No, 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 no. I didn't think so, but I didn't know. How was the transition? When did she stop managing you and how was the transition back to being mother and daughter? Was it a transition? No, I mean, family first, you know, my family is my family and my mum and my brother, now my brother's wife and the kids, um, she has taught me everything I know. You know, she is just an incredible woman who, when their kid, you know, starts so young in the industry, they just, you know, do everything they can to make sure they protect. And my mother's kind of fearlessness, she's creative, actually, but also... You couldn't really tell my mum, like, I can't. You couldn't tell my mum, like, she's got her mind of, like, what she sees this as and and we've all got really strong kind of opinions and um, passion, I'd call it, more than an opinion. We're all very passionate and... But no, my mum and I, she is the best mum a girl could ask for. It's beautiful to see you happy, so happy. Thank you, thank you. We got ourselves into the mood on the day that Delta came into the office for this interview by playing... uh, some of her old music very loudly over the sound system here at Mamma Mia and everyone got really excited and nostalgic. She came in looking immaculate with her team. She'd been doing a day of publicity and she just is human sunshine. She's just the loveliest, loveliest woman and I so enjoyed our conversation. Her album is really great and it sounds really different for her. I, I really enjoyed listening to it and reading the book that she wrote about it. There's lots of pictures of her boyfriend in the book if you want to see what he looks like. He's a babe. And she sort of clammed up a little bit when I brought him up, but she references him quite a bit in the book and I didn't realise until our conversation that they'd worked together he'd been in her band for a long time and they'd been friends before um, they got together and I think they've been together for about three years now and you can understand when you when you sort of go back over you know I was doing my research before this interview and seeing how there's been such public interest in her since she was 15 years old and her relationships with people like Mark Philippoussis, the tennis player, who she was with when she was just sort of 17 or 18 when she was diagnosed with cancer. And um, I remember she went to the Logies with him, I think, one time when she had either a wig on or she had, she'd lost her hair after a chemo. And then she was engaged to Brian McFadden and you can really see why she now wants to keep that for herself. And you can see that he very much influences her music and he's got co-writing credits on a lot of her tracks and plays with her all the time and you can see him on her Instagram. But, you know, she wants to keep that private, which I totally understand. 
Anyway, it was so lovely to see her, to see her happy, to see her well. What a thing, man, to see that video, and we'll put a link in the show notes, but to watch that video, if you haven't already, of when she couldn't talk and over the year that she was doing speech therapy, watching her trying to talk and how frustrating that must have been. And the fact that no one found out about it is just astonishing. So at least she had the ability to sort of recover and do that in private. Delta's album is called Bridge Over Troubled Dreams. There's a companion book that's out by Simon & Schuster. Get your ears and eyes into those and there's links in the show notes to all of those things. If you like this show, can I ask a favour? Can you go and leave a review in uh, whatever podcast app you use and tell a friend? The assistant producer of No Filter is Lucy Neville and the executive producer of No Filter is Eliza Ratliff. I'm Mia Friedman and I'll see you on the Mamma Mia app. Giving birth is like... Tugging, yeah, it's the best word for it. For me, it was like a hook in your cervix and just pulling it out. Painful, period, like cramping, very low. I don't have any negative memories. Combination of the bad period with the pain in the back as well as the pain running down your legs and it's everything at once. Hello, my name is Jessie Stevens, and one day I'd like to have a baby. There's just one small problem. I'm absolutely bloody terrified of birth. I'm scared of the pain and the unknown and not being entirely in control and also the word episiotomy. Which is why I'm hosting Mamma Mia's brand new podcast called The Delivery Room. I'm on a voyage speaking to eight women over eight weeks about eight very different types of birth. And that's when the midwives were like, we've really got to get this baby out. We're going to have to do an emergency caesarean. Are you okay with that? I'll even give their birthing partners a ring to get the details they might have forgotten. Oh, my God. Did she howl? She was, I was like, oh, my God, someone give her the epidural or I'll do it myself. Will my new friends make me feel more comfortable about giving birth? It was fantastic. It was just the best moment. Or will these conversations have the opposite effect? On the third contraction, I think I grabbed Ailey and I'm like, give me the epidural. (laughs) Oh, my God. The Delivery Room. Women on what actually happened during childbirth. Coming soon to a podcast app near you. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures.